Jesus there. Hey, listen, our guest today, all the way from, he and his beautiful wife from Delaware. Delaware, amen. And, but by the way, of other areas too, particularly Los Angeles, where I originally know of him from, because he used to be the minister of music for West Angeles Church of God in Christ. Amen. And uh, has worked with so many incredible artists like, like um, Andre Crouch and James Cleveland, Matty Clark, and many, many others. The list goes on. He has an extensive recording, uh, music recording, and songwriting legacy and history. He's one of the most phenomenal gifted artists in music uh, that uh, we have still with us in the nation. And what a blessed testimony. Matter of fact, he got up briefly last night. I wanted him to share part of his testimony today as well. But we put him up last night in the comedy show to give his testimony. Folks start speaking in tongues, running around, dancing in the church. I'm like, this is a comedy show. The comedians had to get us back to carnality, you know, because we had went straight spiritual. <laughs> it was on and popping because we could all relate to what God had done. And then the comedians start testifying about the miracles of God in their lives. Oh, we were still church of God in Christ. Amen. I'm so thankful he has such an incredible spirit, he and his beautiful wife, Karen, and I'm blessed that they could come and be with us and to be a part of what we're doing. When he leaves here, he's going back to Los Angeles and, and just started his new record company, and Crystal Rucker is on his record label. Amen. Jackie Clark Chisholm is a new artist on his record label as well. And uh, Brandon Porter, is that? I'm not sure if he's on his label yet or not. I, I may have a letter on my desk coming soon or something. I don't know. We're going to see. Uh, but we're so thankful that he's able to be with us. I want you to open your hearts. He's going to do something with our choir as well today. So will you just relax? Look at somebody and say, calm down. Calm, you're going to get to go eat. Calm down. We only have one service today, so calm down, all right? <laughs> really, look at them. It's the spirit back there, isn't it? Amen. All right, if you do this for me, clap your hands because he's going to come. They're going to have a video presentation now, and then he's going to come. That's none other than Bishop Norman Hutchins. Bishop Norman Hutchins was called to ministry at eight years old, licensed as a minister at age 12, and ordained as an elder at age 19. He graduated from Ministerial Training Institute in Inglewood, California with a Master's in Biblical Counseling and an earned doctorate degree in Church Administration. Bishop Hutchins has been preaching the Word of God for 52 years, pastoring for 35, and was consecrated as Bishop over the Frontline Fellowship of Churches in 2015. Throughout Bishop Hutchins' professional gospel music career, many of his songs can be recognized worldwide today such as God's Got a Blessing with my name on it, Jesus I Love You, Emmanuel, and Battlefield. Currently, Bishop Hutchins is the CEO and founder of IR Music Group Record Company, which features some of the top names in gospel music today. Bishop Hutchins understands that music is his gift and preaching is his calling. And to whom much is given, much is required. Greater Community Temple, please welcome Bishop Norman Hutchins Come on, let's give God a hand praise, everybody. Come on, y'all, help me sing this real quick. Can we have a little church? Come on. I like that. Clap your hands. Listen. I'm a soldier on the battlefield. And I'm fighting, saying, fighting for the Lord. I promise him I would serve him until I die. I'm fighting, yes, sir. Fighting for the Lord. On this Christian journey, I've had heartaches and pain, sunshine and rain, but I'm fighting, yes, sir. Fighting for the Lord. Hey, I've been up and up and down, but I'll never turn around. Yes, I'm fighting. Oh, if I hold out, hold out, hold out, hold out, help me say, come on, say, put your hands together, everybody help me say, Oh! 
clap your hands and let's have some church. Y'all all right over there? Y'all all right over there? Y'all all right over there? Come on, choir. How many soldiers we got? Come on. Come on. be seated in the presence of the Lord. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. It is with Jesus' joy that I greet each and every one of you. As I sat there in the seat and was just listening to the history of this great church, the men and the women of God that has given their lives to the kingdom of God. The Bible says, Bishop, that the Lord will not forget your labor of love. And so we salute you today, sir. Let's praise God. Come on, clap your hands and praise God. It's an awesome thing. 
I was taught by my mother that when you meet people for the first time that have heard about you but did not have a chance to meet you, when they finally meet you, they should already know you because your integrity was your introduction. Such an integral man of God has a heart of God, a love for the people of God. And Bishop, I prophesy to you that you still have not seen your best days yet. <laughs> Come on, give the Lord praise. You may be seated, and certainly to his lovely wife, and amen, let's praise God for... And, and happy birthday, Mother. Amen. Is she here? Your mother's here? Oh, she passed. That's right. Okay, today is her birthday. That's what we're celebrating. I do remember your father, though. What an awesome man of God. You stand on the shoulders of one of the giants of the faith. Amen. And the Lord has transferred that anointing over to you. And I'm just honored, Bishop, that out of all the people in the world that you know, that you thought enough to invite my wife and I to come to share and to celebrate in this wonderful occasion. Thank God for my wife for 23 years. Stand up, Lady Hutchins. Yes. And um, 2014, I was on Dallas's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The devil told me this is where you're going to die. The Lord told me I wouldn't be on Dallas in more than six months. The devil laughed at me because the brother to my right had been on Dallas, to my left had been on Dallas just for 10 years. The person across 15, over here was 12. And the devil said, so you think you're going to come up here and in six months? And I said, well, if God said it, I believe it. And that settles it. I had no idea that my wife secretly went and got tested. And one day, uh, as we were having dinner, she said, honey, I got something to tell you. I said, what is it? She said, I got tested. I said, no. She said, yes. She said, and guess what? I said, she said, I'm a perfect match. One in 2.5 million. Amen. And just like God said it, June 24th, 2014, the surgery was a success. Amen. And we praise God for that. They, after the surgery, they rolled her in my room. We were in recovery room together. We were just praising God, held and holding hands and thanking God. They took her to her room, and I got sick, started vomiting. They said, Mr. Hutchins, we put too much fluid in the kidney. It's leaking in your lungs. They took some x-rays, discovered that my lungs was 90% full, only 10% capacity to breathe. They said, we're going to put you to sleep, put you uh, so we can uh, put a tube in your throat and drain the fluid and all this stuff. That's all I remember. I flatlined and died. Dead, dead. Surgeon went upstairs to tell my wife, we're sorry, we just lost your husband. She sat up in the bed and said, he can't die. God's not finished with him yet. I guess they thought she was delusional. She told the nurse, put me in a wheelchair, take me to his room. On her way to my room, the Lord spoke to her and said, pray for me, but don't look at my face. She prayed for me. The nurse says, we got a pulse. Less than 24 hours later, I woke up. They said, what's your name? Norman Hutchins. How old are you? I knew who I was, where I was. That was on a Tuesday. I came home that Saturday and went to church that Sunday. I just tell you, God! Give a shot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I got to preach, but if I had time, I'd tell you, when I was preaching for Bishop Patterson, I fainted midway of the sermon. They picked me up, put me in the chair, and when I finally got back together, I said, the devil is a lot. I got to finish this message. I came back up. I finished the message. When I flew back home, went to the doctor, and they did an EKG, and he said, when did you have a heart attack? I had a heart attack while I was preaching, and God let me live. That's 
That's it. I gotta leave that alone. I gotta go to my sermon. But I just thought about I just thought about 2005 when I woke up one morning. I went to the doctor. They told me he was going blind. And next thing I knew, I went to surgery. Came out of surgery. I was totally blind. Could not see. And 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 and, and I said, God, what's going on? And I didn't hear nothing, but I determined. I said, I'm going to preach every Sunday. And I preached every Sunday blind. My wife would read the scriptures to me through the week. I'd have them memorized by Sunday. And I told the saints, just hang around. I'm going to see one day. They did three surgeries. No success. So I told the doctor, just be honest with me. Will I ever see again? The doctor said, you're a preacher. Don't you believe in miracles? And I remember my last sermon blind. My subject was, this is not how my story ends. And one week from that day, God restored my sight. Look at somebody and tell them, God still work miracle. Last year, September, I was in the hospital for three and a half months because I contracted COVID. They put a tube in my throat again. I was intubated. I was in a coma. Amen. But God, people on my right died. People on my left died. But after three and a half months, I walked out of there. I almost died twice. But God. Somebody shout, but God, but God, but, but, but God. So, so, so the truth is, I have low tolerance for people who don't know how to praise God for what he's done for them. And so can we take just 30 seconds? Because everybody in here got a testimony. Look at somebody and tell them, I know you got a testimony. Can you take 30 seconds and just open your mouth and lift your hands and begin to give God, give, 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 give God, give, give. One day I was riding down the road in my car. And I, was, and I, and I started thinking about all that he's done. Sometimes the best songs come from reflection. While I was driving in my car, I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you are God. Hallelujah, I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you are God. Then I said,
Find your part. to this wonderful weekend of celebration of this 50 years of celebration for this wonderful legacy and this wonderful ministry and to the saints of God, to the men and the women of God. The Lord has laid on the heart of our bishop to give this weekend a theme. Amen. And um, the theme is the resilient church. My God. And the text comes from Matthew chapter number 16, verse 18. He says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The resilient church. What a theme, what a theme, what a theme. When I thought about that, I looked up two definitions that I want to give you. The first definition is, the word resilient is able to withstand or recover from difficult conditions. Definition number two is able to spring back mm, into shape after bending and stretching and being compressed. And what a definition for a resilient church. But I want to come at this thing from a different angle. Amen. And so we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 11, two verses of scripture, verse 22 and 23. And this is what it says. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. 
and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. These two verses in the book of Ezekiel, it was a vision that was given to Ezekiel by God showing Ezekiel when the glory left the temple. And the glory departed from the temple. We're going to come back to that in just a few moments. And so as we talk about this resilient church, I want to talk about today the death of a church. Will you say that with me? The death of a church. You know, uh, uh, research has uh, shown us that there has been more church closing than church planning in recent years. There was a study that was done by LifeWay Research. They reported that more than 4,500 churches closed in 2019 alone. In a recent report, church closing has more than doubled since 20. 19. That would give us about 8,000 churches closing. Many churches imploded because of the stress and the strain of COVID because it caught many by surprise. I was so staggered by that report until I began to research what are the reasons why many of the thousands of churches shut down since 2019. And I came up with what I would consider to be the top seven reasons for churches closing. Number one, a major decline in membership. It seems to be that people across the country are not going to church as much as we used to. I know when I grew up, church wasn't an option. My mother said, if you live in my house, sleep in my bed, eat my food, you're going to church. But now we give our children so many different options. And even adults now have so many different options that now church becomes secondary. Number two, the second reason is the older saints are not being replaced by younger saints. As I travel the country and I minister sometimes to congregations where it seems to be that the youngest person in the church is in their mid-60s. That's a red flag. Because what are you going to do when everybody go to heaven and there's nobody to replace them? That's why I was just so overjoyed to see all of these young people up here ministering and giving their presentation because that is our future generation. I remember growing up in the church in Sunshine Band, YPWW, and all of that. I am a product of the older saints not overlooking the youth but giving them opportunities to grow and to develop their gifts and their talent. And so we cannot turn a deaf ear and just assume that children and that our uh, teenagers and millennials are just going to gravitate to God without some encouragement and certainly without some discipline. Number three, the third reason is churches that are no longer relevant seems to be closing down by the hundreds. Churches that are no longer relevant. How many of y'all remember uh, years ago uh, we used to listen to music on the, on, the, on, the, on the big record? We called it the LPs. How many of y'all remember the 45s? How many of y'all remember the 8-track tape? 
The thing about the tractate was, you know, it, 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 it divided up into like four sections. And so you may have three songs in the first, three in the four, whatever. And if you wanted the third song in the first section, you had to listen to the first two to get to the third. You couldn't just fast forward it. Well, how many of y'all remember when the cassettes came out? How about this? How many of y'all remember when they had an adapter inside of the 8-track that you could put your cassette in? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, here comes CDs. And now CDs are obsolete. Many of you got a car that don't even have a CD player. Because it's all digital now. It's iTunes and Spotify, Apple Music, you see. And, 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 and a, ch a church that closed down because it is no longer relevant would be no different than we're in a tech technical generation of digital age and you're trying to have a, a, a digital ministry with an eight-track mentality. And so it's no longer relevant. Number four, the fourth reason why many churches are closing down, and you know this, is because of gentrification. Most churches are usually planted within the community of, of the African-American neighborhoods. And as I travel the country, I've talked to many pastors and even bishops who says that their plight is that uh, when developers come in and buy up the property, even if you bought your house in the 50s and you may have paid $20,000 for it and the value has gone up, but because this person sold their land and they sold their land, the taxes go up and you got a house that's paid for, but you can't afford the taxes. And so you are forced to sell. And to get something affordable, now you live about an hour or an hour and a half away from where you grew up at church. And now it got to a point where I can't drive an hour and a half to church. And now the church suffers because it cannot meet its financial responsibilities. And so the church closes. Now, if I had time, and I don't, I'd tell you the, 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 how to solve a closing church from gentrification. And it's very simple. Move where the people are. Okay, I'll leave that. Number five is the lack of theological training and experience. The lack of theological training and experience. Because we got a generation of people today, you're not going to preach to them the way they preached to us when we were growing up. You didn't ask questions. It was disrespectful. My pastor, my pastor, said, you, he would say, did you hear me what I say? And guess who I sat down. But nowadays, listen, they got questions that needs answers. Amen. And, and, and just uh, the hand on the side of your head and squalling and hollering, uh, 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 that's not going to answer those questions. And if you don't answer the theological questions that the generation have today, they're going to seek somebody else that has it. But the danger is it may not be proper. Amen, somebody. That's why the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the other thing I know is that you can know all the scriptures that you want, but if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, your revelation is no deeper than the surface. Great God today. Number six, Lord. Number six. The reason why many churches are closing is because of immorality and the lack of self-control. Immorality. And the lack of self-control. There was a story told uh, 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 about uh, a farmer that had a bull and he had six cows. And they were in a fence. And all that bull had to do all day long was eat grass and satisfy them cows. But he messed around looked over the fence and saw three cows in a distance. And he decided... He wasn't satisfied with his six cows. He wanted the three on the other side. And so every day he tried to jump the fence, but he couldn't make it. 
And so one day out of desperation, he, he, he backed up and he took off and he leaped as high as he could. And he barely made it, but on his way, he cut himself so deep that he would never be able to cross back over. But he wasn't concerned because he saw three new cows. So he started running toward those three cows. And when he finally got up to them, he discovered that they were bulls just like him. Because the grass always looked greener on the other side. Yes. And so that's, that's six legitimate reasons why churches have closed. Of course, mismanagement is certainly so as well. But I wasn't satisfied with that. So God, there got to be another reason. And then the Holy Ghost revealed it to me. He said, Norman, the leading cause of church closing that goes unreported is the glory lifted or the glory was never present. Hallelujah. Because if a church experiences the real Shekinah glory. You become, a re, you become a resilient church that can survive anything. Great God to them. See, when God told Moses to lead the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, he gave them the Shekinah glory cloud. It was the visible presence of God. And so the Bible says in Exodus, as the cloud moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped. When it moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped. Now, why was it important for them to follow the cloud? It's because there was always three things in the cloud. Number one, you had the presence of God. Number two, the anointing of God. And number three, the provisions of God. And I'm telling you, a church cannot close down if you have the presence of God, the anointing of God, and the provisions. If you close, the question is, what cloud were you really under? Because he says, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail, amen, against it. A church... Without the glory is only a religious community center. You are helping people physically, but you are of no value to them spiritually. Great God today. And God is not just concerned about the physical man, but he's concerned about the spiritual man. Well, the Bible declares man shall not live by bread alone, but by every way. Yeah, I feel the Holy Ghost that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It, it was a technique that Jesus mastered. You, so you thought all them folk followed him because they wanted to hear his message? They knew if they tolerated his message, they would get a meal. But one day Jesus must have gotten kind of frustrated. He says, because you follow me for the loaves and the fish. He said, but except you eat of my flesh. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God. And so we have to become uh, uh, not just spiritually minded, but we have to allow the Holy Ghost to give us spiritual discernment. Because the last time I read my Bible, it says, cast not your pearls upon swine and give not that which is holy to dogs. Hallelujah. So if you want the natural bread, you should want the spiritual bread. But as I hurry to my close, Ezekiel was a prophet. Uh, and he actually was a priest before he became a prophet. And he was a part of the first Israelites that was carried away into the Babylonian captivity. There was three captivities, but Ezekiel was a part of the first group 
that went into captivity. And while he was in captivity, it was five years into uh, captivity, that Ezekiel was sitting on the banks of the channel near uh, the refuge camp. Apparently, it was on his 30th birthday when he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, while he was sitting there on the banks in Babylon, in captivity, that God began to show him a vision. And in this vision, God was showing him in, in chapter 8, uh, he was showing him that the glory would return back to Jerusalem. That's good news. He was in captivity, but God showed him a vision. And you read that in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 3, where he says, And he put forth uh, the form of, of a hand and took me by the lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in a vision of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate uh, that looketh low. Uh, 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 toward the north uh, where the seat of the image of jealousy mm, and provoked of jealousy. And so the first thing God showed him in this vision, he, he, it, it didn't say he took him by the head it was, or, the, or by his hand. It was the form of it. In other words, Ezekiel said that's what it felt like. And the difference between a dream and a vision is simply you dream at night while you sleep, but a vision, you see it in the daytime. But in this vision, God took him over Jerusalem. And as he was looking down, God began to show him some things. And the first thing he showed him was the image of jealousy. It's called the image of jealousy because they were introducing pagan worship. In the temple. Mm. And God called it an abomination. Great God today. Hallelujah. He called it abomination. Because they were in the temple. But they were introducing pagan worship in the presence of God. And we know this because in the next verse God says to Ezekiel. He says you will see greater abominations and so when you look at the seventh verse it says and he brought me into the door of the court mm. and when I looked behold a hole in the wall then said he unto me son of man dig now in the wall and when I had dug in the wall behold a door great God and so he says open the door and when Ezekiel opened the door, what he saw, watch this now, behind closed doors. When I heard that in my spirit, I said, it's amazing how we come to church, but we still live behind closed doors. We can't see it because your shout looks good. We can't see it because you perfected your tongue. But the Bible says, behold, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. And so when Ezekiel opened the door and, and what he saw was, amen, he, he saw behind closed doors 70 elders. And each one of them had their own censer. Amen. And they were worshiping false gods. In the house of God, worshiping another God mm. in the house of God but worshiping another God see 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 idol worship is not just a statue idol worship is anything you put in front of God if your job means more to you than God that's that's idol worship 
if your possessions mean more to you than God, that's idol worship. And your idol worship is no different than what the elders did behind closed doors. Great God today. And so the elders, here's, here they are, in a hidden place, in the temple, in a hidden place, behind closed doors, and the elders were chanting. You see it in verse 12. This is what they said. They said, the Lord does not see us. He has forsaken us. He don't see us. He's forsaken us. And oftentimes, what propels people to turn to other sources as opposed to waiting on God is when he doesn't answer your request when you request. But an old mother said years ago, he may not come when you want him, but it's always on time. Great God today. Then, then you see in verse number 13, uh, he says to Ezekiel, he says, he said also uh, unto me, turn thee yet again and thou shalt see great abominations that they do. Then in verse 14 he says, And he brought me in the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And when he looked there, he saw the women. My God, they were weeping. They were weeping and calling on their God, who is the fertility God. Mm, great God. In the temple, praying to a false god to make me fertile. My God. It's amazing sometimes how we, amen, uh, we, we go to people and we go to things that we're really supposed to get from God. Hallelujah. And finally, God says, Ezekiel, he says, that's not all, that's not all. He says, there's more abominations. And then he showed him in verse 15. He says, and so he brought me into, watch this, the inner court of the Lord's house. Uh-oh, the inner court. Now, you know who's in the inner court. You had to be a priest to be in the inner court. And so in the inner court, he sees priests. He says, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar. Oh, my God. Between the porch and the altar. Great God today. He says, we're about, 20, uh, about two and 20 men or 25 priests. And their backs were uh, backward toward the temple of the Lord. And their faces... Uh, toward the east, here it is, and they were worshiping the sun, not the S O N, but the S U N. And God shows Ezekiel all of the abominations that's going on, watch it, in God's house where the glory is. And because God's glory cannot and will not be defamed, and because he will not dwell in an unclean temple, the Bible says, and his glory lifted because of the abominations. And so God removed the glory from the temple. When I read that, one of the things that really troubled me in my spirit was I've been to churches oftentimes where the glory has lifted and they don't even know it. And the reason they don't know it is because what we thought was glory was only, was only a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. But if you have ever, great God today, my Lord, I hear you. If you have ever experienced the glory, you can tell it when it doesn't exist. If you have ever experienced
experience the glory, you can tell the shake and the quake. But there's no power. Hallelujah. Because when the glory shows up, it's more than a shout. It's more than a dance. When the glory shows up, amen, you see miracles, signs, and wonders. Hallelujah. Because when God's glory shows up, everything that he is, is in his glory. And if you need a miracle, it's in his glory. If you need a breakthrough, it's in his glory. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 5, verse 26, he says, watch this, I love this. He says, and they were all amazed. Mm. And they glorified God. And were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Two things in that text. My God, they were all amazed. And when they left out, their testimony was, we have seen strange things today. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you left church amazed? <laughs> I'm not talking about happy. I'm not talking about happy. I just left church happy. Fulfilled, yes, yes. But, but amazed. Because you experienced something in the glory of the worship service that only God could. My God, sometimes God will do a whatchamacallit. Would you, you, you know a whatchamacallit is? A whatchamacallit, I don't even know what to call it. So I'll just name it later. But sometimes he'll do what I call a thingamajig. My God, he done turn your life upside down. My God, when last time you seen a drunk person in church get sober? When last time you seen a demon cast out of somebody? When, la when, when, last, time, when last time you really seen a genuine miracle that wasn't motivated because somebody went on Facebook and learned your information? amazed because you can call my name I'm not amazed because you know my phone number and my address anybody can do that but I'm amazed when God does something that man cannot do hallelujah ask your neighbor when was the last time you've been amazed think about it in this one chapter in this one chapter, in this one chapter, we see more, uh, we see more in this one chapter than most churches see in a lifetime. I'm almost finished. Look, Luke chapter 5. Here's the first thing we see. We see Jesus at the lake of Nazareth. The fishermen have been fishing all day. They caught no fish. Jesus come along and says, hey, launch out into the deep. Throw out your nets. And because they obeyed Jesus, they, they enclosed a multitude of fish. Great God today. Well, you want me to tell you why they really found fish? They found fish because Jesus didn't tell them to fish in shallow water. He told them to launch out in the deep. And the reason why many people won't get miracles is because you're afraid to launch in the deep. See, the deep is outside of your comfort zone. Great. My God. See, see if, you, if you start drowning in shallow water, all you got to do is stand up. But if you start drowning in the deep, you're going to need somebody to help you. And God says, you ain't ready for a miracle until you reach to the point that nobody can help you. Not your mama, not your daddy, not your friend. But it will take God. Hallelujah. In that one chapter, in that one chapter, we see a man with leprosy healed. In that one chapter, hey man, we see a man of pulses. They heard that Jesus was over here preaching in the house. 
And so they got together. And when they got the man and got the man, they won't take him in the house so Jesus could heal him. Uh, all of a sudden, they couldn't get in the house because the house was packed, jammed, and running over. And so what they did was they tore the roof off and they lowered him down inside. Amen. Of the house. When was the last time we had to tear off the roof to get somebody in the house? Amen. To experience a move of God. Great God today. I'm finished. I'm finished. I'm finished. Says, and they were amazed. Hallelujah. My God. And they glorified God. And they were filled saying, we have seen strange things. Hallelujah. This is how you can tell. Amen. When the glory shows up. Amen. You see strange things. Strange things. See, when they were in the wilderness, they saw strange things. They woke up one morning and saw manna falling from heaven. Matter of fact, the word manna means what is it? They didn't know what to call it. They said, what in the world is this? It was manna. A strange thing. Amen, somebody. And God says, and the manna will not cease until you cross over into the land of Canaan. And you know how we know it was time to cross over? It's because the Bible says, and when they crossed over, the manna ceased. But the problem with the church today is, is, is we're treating manna like it's Canaan. See, manna is just enough. Canaan is more than enough. And when you get stuck on manna, Hallelujah. See, manna is just enough for you and your four and no more. The devil's not afraid of you if all you have is manna. You can't help nobody else. But God wants you in Canaan where there is more than enough. Hallelujah. But if you can't be faithful with manna, you won't be faithful in Canaan. That's why he says, so I'll let you guys march around this mountain for 40 years. And you will not cross over into Canaan until your mentality changes. In other words, you got to know how to be in the wilderness with a Canaan praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got to be in the wilderness. With a cane and bread. See, see, because, see, because if, if provisions is the only thing that motivates you to worship, if provisions is the only thing that, that, that promotes you to praise, what you gonna do if you get Canaan and you got everything you need? And so I'll learn how to praise him in the wilderness just because. Somebody shout, just because. Hallelujah. And so, the truth of the matter, my brothers and my sisters, if the glory doesn't exist in your church, hallelujah, if the glory doesn't exist in your church, the church was closed before you put the padlocks on the door. Hallelujah. But as I close, the good news is, somebody shout, the good news is, the good news is God gave Ezekiel two more visions. Number one, the first vision he gave him was uh, that the glory would return in the temple. And the second vision he gave him was he saw uh, that the glory of the latter house, oh, I like that, will be greater than that of the former. Somebody shout, greater glory. Yes, Lord, he says, uh, the glory of the latter shall be greater than that of the former. Haggai 2 and 7 says, he says, and I will shake all nations. Somebody shout, COVID shook the nation. COVID shook the world. God said, I will shake all nations. And their desires of all nations shall come. He said, and I will fill this house with my glory, said the Lord. Then in the eighth verse, he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. And then in the ninth verse, he said, the glory of the latter house shall be greater 
than that of the former. Bless the name of the Lord. I kept on reading, but the Holy Ghost said, hold up, Norman. Go back to the seventh verse and read it again. Well, I went back to the seventh verse and I began to read it again. He says, and I will shake the nation and the desire of the nation shall come and I will fill this house with my glory. He said, now skip down to the ninth verse. He said, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. I said, Holy Ghost, what are you trying to tell me? He says, what does the seventh verse have in common with the ninth verse? You're telling us that the glory is going to return. The, the, the anointing of God, the presence of God, and the provisions of God is going to return. Then he asked me a question. He said, have you ever wondered why I put the eighth verse between the seventh and the ninth verse? I looked at it again, and he said, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord. What God wants us to understand, that when the glory shows up, silver shows up gold shows up in other words provision shows up look at somebody and tell them God is my provision if you believe it clap your hands and say yeah but he told Ezekiel I just want you to remember one thing he said everybody is not going back to Jerusalem and so when the king made the decree anybody that want to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple you can go not everybody went but the Bible says just a remnant went back and rebuild the temple ladies and gentlemen boys and girls I got a news flash for you everybody is not coming back to church but the good news is, God has a remnant. God's got somebody that's going to stand no matter what the world is doing. That's going to stand no matter what's going on. And I got one question for you. Am I preaching to any remnants in the house today? Have you made up in your mind? I want the glory. I want the presence of God. If that's you, jump to your feet and clap your hands and give, 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 give. Give him glory. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm finished. The death of a church. The building may exist. There may be people in the building. But if God is not there, if the glory is not there, And the truth is, it's not just a building. Because you are the church. You are the church. The building is the meeting place. And for those of you who find it hard to return back to church because of the last two years you've gotten comfortable scientifically they say it only takes 21 days to develop a habit we've had two years to get comfortable eating your breakfast in your pajamas and watching church now if you cripple and can't come if you sick and can't come I understand but don't let me catch you in the mall
And you go to work every day. It was good that God provided a way of us to stay connected in that down season. But Bishop, I believe that the blessing of COVID was that God allowed the church to hit the reset button. And think about what is really important as it becomes as it becomes to the things of God. I call it back to basics. Great God today. So that we can see the presentation of the Holy Ghost. The Lord told me, he says, Norman, I want your church service to be 90% vertical in its presentation. A church whose service is 90% horizontal will never experience the glory. That's just my belief. Because if you make it about you and not about God, we can't experience the glory. And Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimonies of God. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Watch this. But in the demonstration, that's it right there, the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'll never forget it. My wife and I, we were ministering to a young lady at our church. She came in. She witnessed her husband committing suicide. And when she came to our office, she was dealing with that. And we discerned that there was a suicidal spirit that had attached himself to her. And we started praying. Now, we got other folk in the office working on staff. And my wife and I start praying. And we start commanding that devil to come out. And she made a loud noise and, you know, and one of the things I learned growing up as a young elder is that one of the ways you can tell that a person has been delivered from a demon is if you can get them to say, Jesus, Jesus, the blood of Jesus, thank you, God. And so I said, come on, say Jesus, Jesus. She starts saying, Jesus, Jesus. I said, open your eyes. She opened my eyes. She said, oh, my. And then the Holy Ghost said, he's camouflage. He's camouflage. And when I said, devil, you ain't fooling us. You in there. You camouflage. And I said, the name of you coming out. And when I went to lay hands on her, she screamed so loud, so much so. She knocked me, my wife, all three of us on the floor. Blah, 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 blah. And nobody in that whole office came in to see if we was okay. He starts squirming like a snake. And we, I did like the mothers did in the, back in the day. You ain't leaving here until you get your deliverance. And she got her deliverance. And the demon was cast out. I don't know. See, 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 in this modern day, here's what the devil has, here's what he's discovered. He discovered if I act up in church, you still got some sanctified Holy Ghost filled folk that's going to cast me out. So, so he says, I'll just come to church, let you have church, let you enjoy church. Oh, just have yourself a good time. And he'll wait to manifest after you leave church. But my bishop, when I was a young guy, I, we used to call him Demon Hunter. He'd go to church looking for a demon. Hey, man, if you act like you had one, he... Hallelujah. All I'm saying is we can't throw everything away that our forefathers and ancestors has taught us. They didn't know Hebrew and Greek, but they knew how to plead the blood of Jesus. Am I right about it? Yes, yes. And so he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Bouncing back. Bend, but don't break. Saints of God, you hang in there with your bishop. Don't let life pull you away. You hang in there. Amen. And if God so decide to lead you to another state or anywhere else, love your bishop enough. He poured into you for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Love him enough. He, he buried your, your, your family members. He preached your weddings. And, and he was there for your children when they graduated. He was there to counsel you when you needed counseling. And then you just going to walk away and not say nothing? Great God. Love God enough. Respect your man of God enough. to say, Bishop, I need to talk to you. Yes. Bishop, I'll tell you a story. And I'm going to pray. Please remain standing if you can. I just felt in my heart that my wife and I wanted to establish a church in Los Angeles, in Inglewood. So we have frontline, East Coast, frontline, West Coast. So we were flying back every other week, actually. But before I birthed the church, I met with my spiritual father, Bishop Blake. I was in his office. I said, Bishop, my wife and I, we just feel leading to birth a church in Inglewood, which is about a good 30 minutes away from West Angeles. And he poured into me. He gave me his blessings. He anointed me. But as I left, he said, he said, he said this to me. He says, don't hurt the mother church. Now, many people may not understand what that is, Bishop, but you and I know what that means. <laughs> and I told Bishop, I said, I would never hurt the mother church because I'm the man I am today, the husband and preacher, because God placed you in my life. So we began to birth the church. And in about two months, the church had grown to almost 100 people. But when I looked out there in the audience one Sunday, I counted about 15 people from West Angeles. And I told my wife, we got to shut it down. And we shut it down. I wouldn't do that to my father. But when we did that and went back home, great God today, God multiplied us in Delaware. Did you hear what I said? Hallelujah to God. And so there's a right way and a wrong way to do anything. You are a resilient church because you have a resilient leader. Amen. And I prophesy that this church will never be in the statistics category of a church that has died hallelujah there will be no demise and you need to understand something that the anointing flows from the head down and if you stick with the anointing that God has placed on the man of God's life your life will be anointed you will continue to be tremendously blessed. I'm praying, but in the glory is the presence of God, the anointing of God, and the provision. And if you know that there's an area in your life that you need God to touch, I want to pray for that right now. If you know that there's an area in your life that you need God to move in, I want to pray for that right now you know in the moments that I died people asked me did I see the light and all that kind of stuff no I didn't see no lights but I tell you what I did experience my mother passed in 1985 and while I was dead I saw my mother's face I didn't see her whole body I saw her face and around her was some elderly people but they looked so healthy and my mama had that look on her face that I remember growing up as a child. You know, when you get in trouble, you do something, and all they got to do is just look at you. She had that look that said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I remember that. And when I woke up, after God brought me back to life, I asked, you know, it, it took a minute, but after about maybe a, a, a couple of days, 
I start reminiscing some, some stuff that I experienced. And, 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 and two things, well, two things, two things. The first thing was, I said, wait a minute. I saw giants standing at my door. And, and I, I said, God, what, 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 what were them giants? I mean, they were so tall, it looked like their head was touching the ceiling. And, and I couldn't see their face because their backs were to me. They were stand, one was on the left, one was on the right. And they had military uniforms on like I'd never seen it. No country has what I saw. And it was all, but it was all one color. Like a bronze, like a, almost a bronze taupe kind of color. And I, asked, I said, what was that, what was that, what was that, what was that? He says, there was angels I put at your door. To protect you from the enemy, and man, I, I just felt the I just felt the glory of God all over me. And then I remembered a message that God had birthed in my spirit while I was dead. My church was the first church I ever shared it with. He says, "Just tell my people, God, I give you glory." He says, "Tell my people that you cannot live bad enough." For God to ever hate you. And then he says, and you cannot live good enough for him to love you any more than he already does. Because you are his creation. Come on, clap your hands and give him glory. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we adore you. We're grateful that you love us enough that you will speak to us. We have nothing of value that we can give to you to show our level of love and gratitude for who you are. So please accept our worship, our allegiance and our obedience. Let it be an offering of value to you. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. For so often, God, we thought we had to earn your love. If I can live good enough, if I can live safe enough, perhaps you'll love me. But you commended your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. You gave the best gift you ever had, and that was your son. Father, you said that if I would just confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, that I can be saved. The gift of eternal life. And I praise you for it. We love you for it. Because you're a great God. Bless your people today. Let the glory of God be with them. Not just in this sanctuary, but as they leave today, let your glory show up in their life. Let them feel your anointing. For that lonely man, that lonely woman, let them feel your presence. Let them feel your anointing, the effectiveness of your power. Amen. To, to counterpoint them in their dreams and visions and destiny and purpose. Let your glory be revealed, manifested through provision. For the silver is yours, the gold is yours. And we praise you for it. Not because I've been so faithful. Not because I've been so good. You've always been there for me. To provide my every need. You were there when I was lonely. <laughs> You were there in all my pain. Yes, you were. Guiding my footsteps. Shelter from the rain. Come on, y'all. And it was you that made my life complete. And you are to me my everything. And that is why I sing. Y'all help me sing this. Come on, everybody. Jesus, I love you. Because you care. Because you care. Help me sing that. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine what life would be. Come on and say, Jesus, I love you. 
Yes, I'd be caught to care. Oh, my, 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 my. I couldn't imagine. Yes, you were. Come on, turn around, Jesus. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on, y'all, sing that with me. Come on. If you love him, sing it. Come on. Come on and say, Jesus, I love you. Oh, my, my, my. I love you, Jesus. Come on, Jesus, I love you. Say it. For your grace and your mercy. For your love and your kindness. I love you, Jesus. Take it up. Take it up. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Hey, because. Come on and say. Because 